all aboard. We're on the little train that goes from Jerusalem's Jaffa Gate and weaves through the sacred old city down to the Western Wall to pray. And we want to invite you to come along and support us financially so that the Jerusalem Channel can continue to move in the presence of God throughout this old city and throughout this nation. Thank you for supporting us, and we invite you to go to the donate page of our website, JerusalemChannel.tv. God bless you out of Zion. The Jerusalem Channel is made possible by viewer support. Thanks for watching. One sure sign that we're living in the last days is the shocking immodesty and degradation of women. It's a strange irony because our times are supposed to be all about the emancipation of people and the empowering of women. However, despite strides made in recent generations concerning women's rights and equality, both women and men have never been in a more desperate need for excellent role models. And the best place to look is in the Bible. Shalom, I'm Christine Darg. We're definitely living in the last days. Everything seems to be falling apart. Moral relativism and identity politics are deceptive and many people are lost with no definite direction. A recent shocking poll in the United States said that there is a great rise in the number of persons who have no religious affiliation whatsoever. Recent protests and demonstrations by women have put an international spotlight on some of the coarsest, foul-mouthed women I've ever seen. Their vulgar, unrestrained behavior would have shocked my parents' generation to the core. Even some Muslim women who dress modestly shout shocking genocidal hatred toward the Jewish people. Young people are desperately in need of excellent role models, and certainly two of the best examples from the pages of the Bible are Ruth, a Gentile, and Queen Esther, a Jewish heroine. The Bible gives us a number of female deliverers, in fact, in Israel. Miriam, the sister of Moses and Aaron, the prophetess Deborah, and the housewife Yael, all who were instruments in the saving of their people. Esther is counted amongst the prophetesses of Israel. Much has been made of her beauty. The truth is, she was trained in how to beautify herself, because even a plain-looking woman can learn how to make herself attractive. And I appreciate the commentary on the book of Esther concerning women's duty by Marianne Farthenham, an English Victorian Baptist. She was an educator, journalist, and lecturer at a time when women weren't expected to enter public life. Marianne Fardenham wrote a woman's sermon to other women in which she asked, what is women's duty? And she said, it's to be gentle, true, and devoted. It's to be as strong as it is within her to be and to be as beautiful as possible. She says, it's to be a discreet keeper at home a willing performer of out-of-sight duties, a helpmeet to man, a mother in Israel, a handmaid of the Lord. While those words are certainly biblically correct, they are cringeworthy for the politically correct of our times. However, Esther was more than just a pretty face. She was willing to sacrifice position, fame, and even life itself for a higher goal and godly principles. She also knew how to conduct herself and to speak wisely in an atmosphere of political correctness. And Esther 4.14 is the famous verse containing her commission to intercede on behalf of the Jewish people. And it declared, For if you altogether keep silent at this time, then shall enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. Esther's bravery and her courage of her intercessory handmaidens 
inspired seven of us intercessors to embark on a prayer journey into biblical Persia, modern-day Iran. While in Hamadan, we visited the actual synagogue, which still stands, where both Esther and her cousin Mordechai are buried. And God gave us many divine appointments during our very purposeful journey as the Lord's messenger girls and Bible women. Esther's story is a proverbial rags-to-riches saga. She won a crown and a kingdom while also becoming the savior of her own people. Her great opportunity became a test to see if she would be more loyal to God than to position and fame. And in Shushan, Iran, we visited the ruined palace of the king of Persia, Queen Esther's husband. The foundation stones of the king's throne were covered by weeds and wildflowers, a stark reminder that kingdoms come and go, but the throne of our God is established forever. Well, Esther was a real-life Cinderella who knew how to wait upon God to be bold and to be totally led by the Holy Spirit. She arose to position in the 5th century BC in a Persian empire that stretched all the way from India to Ethiopia. In the book of Esther, the age-old problem of anti-Semitism once again rears its ugly head. The Jewish people were scattered throughout the Persian empire, and a plot to destroy them was hatched by a fanatical anti-Semite named Haman. I'm supposed to say boo whenever Haman's name is mentioned because Jewish people deride his memory. Unfortunately, Haman was the king's viceroy and a descendant of Israel's ancient enemy, the Amalekites, and the Amalekite king Agag. Because Haman was offended by just one Jewish man, by Mordecai, who had refused to bow to Haman, Haman connived to persuade the king to issue an edict to exterminate all the Jews throughout the empire. And such is the irrationality of anti-Semitism. Esther fasted for three days and nights, interceding on behalf of her people. She resolved to risk her life to approach the king because to approach the king uninvited was a capital offense in those days. But the king extended his golden scepter to her. Esther was accepted with great favor in the king's court, and her bravery encourages us to believe that when a crisis develops, God will grant us wisdom, grace, and strategy. When we step out in faith at the Lord's leading, the way is often made clear and doors open. The king's response was amazingly generous. He promised to give Esther up to even half of his kingdom. But she didn't make her petition known right away. She possessed great restraint and a sense of timing. The name Esther means something hidden, and the Gemara says that the name Esther is derived from the Hebrew root of the word to hide. And it refers, the rabbis say, to Deuteronomy 31.18 where God says, on that day, I will hide my face from you. So she was a secret follower of the living God. Like Nicodemus in the New Testament, you may be a secret believer, but eventually the truth will come to the service for such a time as this. According to the sages, Esther and her cousin Mordecai were descended from the tribe of Benjamin and from Benjamin was also Israel's first King Saul. That's a significant fact because Haman was descended from King Agag, whom Saul had foolishly spared against God's orders. But now Esther and Mordecai had an opportunity to correct Saul's weakness by being the agents of the downfall of Agag's descendant, Haman, and Haman's sons. Mordecai had carefully warned Esther that if she herself failed to act on their behalf, deliverance would come for the Jewish people from someone else. And that's a word that remains true up to this very moment. If Christians don't pray for and support Israel at this time on the other side of the Holocaust, when modern-day Persia, Iran, is actually threatening them, God will raise up others to protect the Jewish people, but we ourselves may perish. Many years ago, God spoke to me in a dream that I must stand with the Jewish people when all the nations turn against Israel before the great 
tribulation. Well, the name Esther in Hebrew is Hadassah, which means myrtle. And I'm told that the leaves of the myrtle tree only yield fragrance when crushed. And so Esther ran the risk of being crushed by approaching the king's throne, for she had already resolved, if I perish, I perish. Therefore, in her humility and brokenness, Esther was fragrant to God and the king. She was wisely aware that she lived in the king's palace only by divine appointment. As queen, she was uniquely positioned to influence the king. It's fascinating that some Christian theologians have questioned the inclusion of the book of Esther in the canon of scriptures because God's name is not overtly mentioned in the text once. Yet his name is encoded in the text just as his presence is everywhere. The rabbis explain that sometimes God intervenes with miracles, such as the wonders that were experienced by the Jewish people, the ten plagues against Egypt, and the splitting of the Red Sea during their exodus. But the sages say God mostly works in a hidden way. And although God's name doesn't overtly appear in the book of Esther, as a result of the use of acrostics, the name of God and other names for God are hidden no less than eight times. And the scribes sometimes presented the acrostics with letters in bold characters. And that enabled the reader to recognize the name of God standing out in the text. God may hide his face, but he has promised always to watch over the destiny of the Jewish people. Esther and her cousin Mordechai believed in the indestructibility of the Jewish nation. Meanwhile, she received what could only be a divine strategy to invite the king and Haman to a banquet. And also in the meantime, the king couldn't sleep. So he asked for the royal records to be read, and he learned that Mordechai had foiled a plot to assassinate the king. But Mordechai had never been properly rewarded. And my friends, in this life we may often go unrewarded, but... The Bible encourages us to endure hardness and to remain faithful to our calling because the Lord is a God of justice. The king was now very concerned to put things right, so he summoned Haman to ask what should be done for the man whom the king delighted to honor. Of course, self-centered Haman was only capable of seeing honors heaped upon himself. Doesn't the Bible wisely teach us that we should make a habit of esteeming others better than ourselves? But Haman suggested the highest honors. And to his utter shock, the king replied, Go immediately and perform these honors for Mordechai the Jew. Well, Haman was horrified, but he had no choice but to put the king's robe on Mordechai and parade Mordechai on the king's horse through the streets, proclaiming, This is how the king honors the man in whom he delights. Well, devastated, miserable Haman went home to his wife, Jerash, another anti-Semite, who prophesied that Haman would surely fall before Mordechai the Jew. Well, according to Jewish commentaries, Jerash was a sorceress. She had already convinced Haman to prepare a gallows to hang Mordechai but the Jewish nation can't be exterminated. They have a very significant and prophetic role to play in world history in the last days. They must be resettled in their own land to welcome back King Messiah, even Jesus himself. Esther moved with the unction of the Holy Spirit, and the timing to expose Haman wasn't right at the first banquet, so she planned a second banquet. Up to this point, the king had no idea that his queen was Jewish. But now Esther reveals dramatically that I and my people have been sold for destruction and slaughter. The king was in total shock. Like Nathan the prophet who confronted King David after David had sinned, Esther could have accused her husband by saying, Thou art the man. But instead, she dramatically pointed at the villain Haman 
saying the adversarian enemy is this wicked Haman. Well, the king was so enraged that he left the room to cool down. But soon he returned, only to find Haman groveling for mercy on Esther's couch. The king shouted, Will he even molest the queen? And so he ordered Haman to be hanged upon the very gallows constructed for Mordechai. Also, the king reversed his former edict against the Jews. And this is what the holiday of Purim is all about. In order to choose the date for the destruction of the Jews, Haman had cast lots called Purim. The word Purim is plural, and indeed, there have been many so-called Purim pogroms throughout the history of the Jewish people. That's multiple plots through the centuries to annihilate the Jewish people. But the God of Israel has decreed otherwise. He still has an end-time purpose for his people Israel. So Esther's people were authorized by the king to fight back, and they enjoyed a great victory. And did you know that King Jesus has authorized his followers to fight back against our spiritual enemy, demonic forces, the causes of sickness, disease, and defeat? Never, ever forget that. In Matthew 10, 1, Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority over unclean spirits so that they could drive them out and heal every disease and sickness. Hallelujah. And in Mark 16, 18, Jesus has promised this power to every believer in his name. Well, it's fascinating in an age of women's rights and criticisms of the Bible that two books in the Bible are named after women, Ruth and Esther. In many ways, Mordecai was the hero of Purim, but the book is named for Esther because she became a female Moses. Like the lawgiver Moses, Esther was privileged to live in a king's palace, yet they both chose to suffer affliction with the people of God. Esther was also a type of the Messiah because like Jesus, like Yeshua, she was willing to forfeit her royal privilege and even face death for the sake of her own people. Esther became a savior of the Jewish people at a very critical time in their history. We'll just never know the far-reaching consequences of our actions until eternity. Esther's decision certainly had very far-reaching consequences. Chronologically, she made possible the book of Nehemiah in the Bible. It was Esther's marriage to the king of Persia that ultimately led to the rebuilding of Jerusalem and facilitated the chain of events that culminated in the arrival of the Messiah five centuries later. Well, all of us are fallible, prone to weakness, and as human beings, we're prone to shrink from duties or opportunities that are potentially perilous. But when the cause of the Lord and his people demand it, we must take up our cross and follow him. God's looking for intercessors and statesmen believers. Commentaries on the book of Esther point out that God does give us from time to time amazingly strategic positions not just to lavish on ourselves, but so that we may use them for his cause, for the spread of truth and the gospel. God commissions us for the times in which we live. Mordecai had challenged Esther with these words, and who knows but that you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And was there ever such a time as our time? God's not willing that any should perish. He loves nations and Israel even better than we do. But he calls us to help individuals and nations. And our opportunity is a test of our character. Will we rise to the occasion? Today, there are opportunities for doing good for believers in every place to benefit our families, cities, nations, churches, and Israel. The Bible commentaries urge that these opportunities should be seized. Because once gone, they may have passed forever. Generally, the opportunities of doing the greatest good are brief. And if opportunities are neglected or delayed, God may send us reminders to take action. Reminded through our parents, friends, or ministers who would be like a Mordecai challenging us. 
The thought that an opportunity is given by God has a great motivational factor. In my own ministry, many times I've been motivated because I was confident that God was needing something and God was sending me or commissioning me. It's also been observed that with every great national emergency, God has raised up a man or a woman equal to the emergency. God called Moses, Joshua, Samuel, Elijah, David and Daniel, Deborah, Esther and Ruth for special works. Every age and every emergency has had men and women of courage who've risen to the challenge. The apostles met the challenge of their day. Of every man and woman who has positively shaped history, it might well be said, you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. So let's recognize that just as Esther and Mordecai had their opportunities, so we're going to have ours. Well, Rabbi Shlomo Riskin, the chief rabbi of Efrat, is a great man of our times, and he's built bridges with the communities surrounding him. He wrote a fascinating article in Esther concerning the difference between an immodest woman and bold women such as Ruth and Esther, our great Bible heroines, who undoubtedly committed what may have been perceived as immodest acts for which they were ultimately praised for their boldness and devotion to help bring about salvation and deliverance for the Jewish people. Both heroines compromised their modesty. Esther in the palace of the king and Ruth, who visited Boaz at night on the threshing floor. Rabbi Riskin wrote that Esther appeared to have been an assimilating Jew. She used her Persian name derived from the pagan goddess Astarte rather than using her Hebrew name, Hadassah. She was willing to undergo a 12-month preparatory beauty treatment, seemingly without protest. The rabbi wrote that Esther even agreed with Mordecai, her cousin, or even perhaps he was her husband, as the Midrash suggests, not to reveal her Jewishness, but to go into the palace. It was only when Mordecai publicly demonstrated in front of the king's gate in sackcloth and ashes against Haman's decree to annihilate the Jews, that Esther was bid, as it were, to come out of the closet and go before the king on behalf of her people. The words Mordecai used to convince Esther have reverberated throughout Jewish history. He said, don't imagine in your soul that you'll be able to escape in the king's palace any more than the rest of the Jews. For if you persist in keeping silent at a time like this, Relief and deliverance will come to the Jews from another place, but you in your father's house will perish. And who knows whether it was just for a time like this that you attained to the royal position. It's a challenge to all of us. I also appreciate what Rabbi Riskin had to say about Ruth, who was a Gentile convert to Judaism and the great-grandmother of King David, an ancestress of Jesus. Unlike Esther, who was born of Jewish parents, but who married a Gentile king, Ruth was a Moabite, and she married a Jew. She followed her Jewish mother, Naomi, to the land of Israel. Unlike her more cautious sister, Orpah, Ruth turned away from security and walked alongside her grieving mother-in-law to Bethlehem. Ruth was willing to care for an elderly widow, which can be strenuous work. But the New Testament in the book of James calls such acts pure religion and undefiled to care for orphans and widows in their affliction. Ruth's ancestor Lot had defected from Abraham when he had left Israel and had moved to Sodom. But now, Rabbi Riskin said, Ruth repaired Lot's error by becoming a second Abraham. Rabbi Riskin observed that, like our forefather, Ruth left her birthplace and homeland for the land of Israel, to her a strange nation, and she joined to the God of ethical monotheism. In her own words, she said to Naomi, Where you go, I will go to the land of Israel. Your God will be my God, your nation will be my nation, and where you die, I will die. In the deepest sense, the rabbi wrote, Ruth entered into Abraham's covenant with God, mentioned in Genesis 12 and 15. 
God had promised Abraham that he would be the father of an eternal nation, that his offspring would never be destroyed and his descendants would live in their homeland of Israel. And through Israel, all the families of the earth would be blessed. That was the promise. The rabbi suggested that this promise was greater than the survival of the Jews in Persia because the promise to Abraham was speaking of world redemption. The rabbi observed that through her actions, Esther succeeded in gaining a respite in persecution, which is the most Jewish people can hope for while in exile in other nations. But Ruth, on the other hand, succeeded in entering into the Abrahamic covenant. And due to her compassionate righteousness and loving kindness toward her mother-in-law, Naomi, Ruth became the herald of Jewish redemption. Her journey led to the day when the nations of the world will join the family of Abraham, father of a multitude of nations. And I have to hasten to add that Ruth's inclusion in the family tree of the Messiah is no accident. In Matthew 1, 5, you see, the law of Moses states without ambiguity that no Moabite should be admitted to the assembly of the Lord, and she was from Moab. Even to the ninth generation, none of their descendants could be admitted to the assembly of the Lord. However, at a time of darkness in Bethlehem and in the Jewish nation, God found that new Abraham in Ruth, the Moabite, who came to dark Bethlehem radiating the light of her faith. And although Jesus was virgin born and he wasn't tainted by the sins of his forebears, nevertheless, the presence of Rahab, a prostitute, and Ruth, a Moabitess, in his genealogy shouldn't shock us. As we meditate on these two surprising women of faith in the genealogy of Jesus, we can learn to be less judgmental of outsiders. Light, you see, can shine from the most unexpected places. Well, to wrap up things today, Queen Esther had put on her royal apparel to appear before the king. She was not called by the king. She went unbidden to petition the king. But you, my friend, I want you to know that we are all called by King Jesus to come to him. He bids us to come. We've all been invited to receive the King of kings and the Lord of lords, even Jesus the Savior. To every single person who will come to him, he extends the golden scepter of his favor. And he doesn't grant us just half his kingdom. He gives us all things in the world to come because God the Father becomes our Father through the Savior, Jesus, Yeshua. Amen. Well, in the meantime, I hope you can join in conversation on these and other topics through our social media pages, or you can also visit our website at exploits.tv to watch our videos 24-7 and also to sign up for our free newsletter, Exploits, based upon Daniel 11.32. The people who do know their God will be strong and take action doing exploits. And there's a third way to keep in touch, and that's through our app, which has a daily Bible study in all of our latest videos to watch for free. You can download our Jerusalem Channel link through the app stores. And so until next time, I'm an evangelist of the empty tomb in Jerusalem, Christine Dart, always contending for the faith and praying earnestly for the peace of Jerusalem. Shalom and Maranatha.